Welcome to Too Good to Be True, an investigative podcast about exposing the scams, schemes, and financial cults trying to separate you from your money. Hey, Julia. Hey. I would absolutely love to talk to you about this upcoming business opportunity I have that I think you could get in on and really pick your brain about whether or not it's right for you. But you know what? While you're here, how about I get you dinner one of these nights? Dinner's on me. Okay. And you just got to hear me out. All right. All right. So first off, are you 28? You're 28 years old or older, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> well, you don't look a day over 28. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you, you guys make more than $60,000 a year, right? Like, I just want to make sure. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, yes. That's, that's awesome. Good for you guys. You've yeah. earned that, huh? Uh, yeah. And it's fun to spend. Well, what do you like about being here in New York so far? Oh, I mean, the food, museums. Yeah, it's a park. ton of fun. And you can't find it anywhere else. No, definitely not. I mean, and how often do you guys even get to travel? I, I mean, we probably do like a bigger trip once a quarter and then maybe like an international trip once a year. Something so you like, like vacationing. It's oh, like yeah, very much. Very yeah, much. it's very studies show the more you vacation the better your outlook for your heart health. I mean, like, cancer. experiences over things, right? Totally. You have to live your life while you're alive. Yeah. And you want to make sure that you can do that. Because, like, what's on your vacation bucket list? Oh my gosh, so many things. Iceland, New Zealand. Um, I haven't really spent any time up in, like, Canada either. Yeah, those costs sound unpredictable. Although all those locations sound really exciting. Yeah. W- wouldn't it be great if there was just a way to spend less on vacation? Like, how much are you spending on each of these trips? I actually know this number because I looked for this last year. It was like 10 grand. Yeah, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And you're not really owning anything for that, right? Guess not. It would be great if you could invest in your future and assure that you could get on all those vacations, right? Wait, what is this all about? Where is this going? (laughs) I think you'd be the perfect candidate for a timeshare. (laughs) I'm sorry, I mean a vacation club. Oh, my lord. (laughs) I knew it! (laughs) Just kidding, guys. You're not in a timeshare facility. You are at Too Good To Be True. I'm your co-host, Ryan Houlihan. Not a timeshare salesperson, (laughs) but a journalist and drag artist in New York City. And I am not the mark. (laughs) I'm Julia Lorenz Olson. I am an accredited financial counselor and a co-creator for Two Cents with PBS. Today we'll be talking about the Disney Vacation Club and other timeshares and vacation clubs, quote unquote, just like it. But before we go to the happiest or most magical places on Earth, first let's talk about timeshares in general. Now, what do you know about timeshares, aside from the fact that thanks to sitcoms and comedians and, you know, the zeitgeist, you might have the general impression that they're kind of bad? Yes. Um, well, I, I have been a beneficiary mm. of uh, the timeshare experience. So I I got married when I was very, very young. I was 20 years old. And we had, like, no money for a honeymoon. So my in-laws very generously basically gifted us some of their timeshare points. And we drove from Texas all the way down to the bottom tip of uh, Florida to go spend some time at a timeshare down there. So I've done it actually a couple times. I've been there. I've been, I think they invited us to, like, Aspen one year or something like that. You're probably the only demographic who really gets value out of a timeshare because <laughs> right? you can pay anything I'm for it. free. Hello. So if you don't know, a timeshare is a mainstay in the American real estate industry and a predatory one at that. According to Investopedia, a timeshare is, quote, a shared ownership model of vacation real estate in which multiple purchasers own allotments of usage, typically in one-week increments in the same property. The timeshare model can be applied to many different types of properties, such as vacation resorts, condominiums, apartments, and campgrounds. Timesharing is a form of fractional ownership, where buyers purchase the right to occupy a unit of real estate over specified periods. For example, purchasing one week of a timeshare means the buyer owns one fifty-seconth of the unit. Buying one month equates to one twelfth ownership. Timesharing is popular within vacation locales where owners may want occasional control of a property. Timeshare property types include homes, condominiums, and resorts. Unquote. 
Now, as to why I would call them so predatory, we'll get into that. We have a lot of data to know that they're bad, and there is a lot of joking and discourse about how predatory timeshares are, and yet the industry persists. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my in-laws, I love them. They're super smart people. I mean, you know, they're not one to just, like, fall for anything. Well, like a lot of the topics we discuss on the show, you don't have to be a rube to fall prey to these kinds of scams. They're highly sophisticated, highly targeted, and if they weren't very good at what they do, they wouldn't have stuck around as long as they have. It's an $8.1 billion industry. (gasps) 9.9 million Americans have timeshares. Whoa, I had no idea it was so widespread. So the pitch of the benefit of a timeshare is kind of best expressed in one of the most popular taglines for timeshares and the original tagline for timeshares, which is, quote, no need to rent the room, buy the hotel, it's cheaper. I mean, that's some slick marketing. Yeah. That's a great line. And especially for something like a vacation, it feels really you you you're you're in a, this glamorous location. It's an exciting thing, and the idea of having sort of as we've said in a lot of these episodes, a power fantasy mm. that you could get a huge return on a very small quote unquote investment. It looks really attractive and fun. Especially vacations look fun. Timeshares also often target lower income families. Not the lowest income, since they do want to be able to bleed you dry, and you have to have some money for that to be possible. But, you know, middle class people who, on the scale of the kind of billionaires who make or break real estate industries, are considerably lower income and probably wouldn't have the ability to purchase a vacation home for themselves. So, for example, you might purchase a week of use of a vacation home. And you can think of yourself in that way as kind of and legally an owner as opposed to a renter or someone who's just throwing money at a vacation. And unfortunately, who are going to struggle already to get Mm. something like a vacation, they struggle for any leisure activities. So by offering them like a theoretically more affordable and empowering option, like they take control of their vacationing future, you can lock them into payment plans that there's no way that they're going to be able to afford. And you can get them to take on an enormous amount of financial risk for almost no return. The financial aspect, you kind of have to make make sense for yourself. Can you line out for me, like, why on a purely just like financial level, why are they actually a terrible investment? So the problem with a timeshare is similar to the problem with a car in which they depreciate in value almost immediately. You know, that's actually really interesting because most... Most people don't realize this, and I learned this in the mortgage industry back in the day, that houses, like real estate, actually depreciates. It's the land that appreciates. So here, you're not owning land, right? You're just owning this, like, weird fractional uh, access. You're basically just owning access, and that does not appreciate. So that actually makes sense to me. So we know that the financial aspects of this don't really add up. No matter who you are, or how close your family is, or how intelligent you are, buying a timeshare is always an emotional decision. It is always something you decide on because of your dreams. And nobody sells dreams better than the Walt Disney Company. And Disney calls their version of a timeshare the Disney Vacation Club, or DVC. So in order to join the Disney Vacation Club, you have to purchase a one-time real estate interest in one of the Disney Vacation Club resorts, which is one of their hotels that they have on the Disney property. Oh, so they have multiples of these. Yes. On I mean, they, they, ha- they even have them off Disney. They have one in um, uh, uh, they have one in Hawaii. They have one in Vero Beach. So even for people that are like, I just want a timeshare and I want to go with this Disney for some reason. Right, because I feel like part of the appeal for other non-Disney timeshares is like you can go anywhere. This idea of like flexibility, right? And you as a, you know, maybe young family, like your kid is not going to want to go when they're like 15 years old, right? Like, yeah. So I'm so that makes sense that maybe now they're offering something. Well, they're else. saying like you can stay at other hotel third party hotel locations, but the truth is you can get better deals on third party hotel locations, usually running Getting through other yourself. discounts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Also, I mean, a lot of the people that this is pushed on, it isn't affordable because it's not like they have the upfront 
cash for this. A lot of them are going on to financing plans through Disney. Oh, uh, what? No, no, no. Giving no. them loans to purchase their future oh, vacations with. So I'm curious, like, what are the actual numbers here? What does this thing cost? So with the Disney Vacation Club, you are purchasing points rather than a set amount of time. We will get to the points. They're kind of like an internal currency. But for the moment, just imagine the points represent the amount of time that you would be spending in a traditional timeshare. Okay. So the initial cost of a Disney Vacation Club membership is going to be at least $32,985. Uh, which includes a purchase price starting at $31,050 for the 150 vacation points and a one-time document preparation fee of $250. Annual dues for members start at $88 per month. If you were to choose to finance the upfront costs, the monthly payment starts at $434 for a 10-year loan with a 10% minimum down payment. Wow. And those annual dues vary based on the number of vacation points you own and the resort where you own them. But in 2019, the annual dues were $7.44 per point. Renting 160 points from a DVC owner each year starts at $19 per point. I can, like, barely keep that in my head. Uh, 30, did you say 32 thousand dollars and you have to put 10 percent down like yes people are financing this and the of in- course the i mean in- who's gonna pay that in cash i mean especially not the people they're targeting no. for this being a value also the interest rate for financing a disney vacation club membership is gonna vary based on the loan term the down payment and your credit worthiness of course so the disney vacation club may offer fixed interest rates at 9.99 percent for a 10-year loan but their maximum rate is 15 percent and if you need quote unquote this financing you're going to be probably getting that worse rate i just ran this quick number and like my mind is extra um melted so if this thing costs let's call it 30 grand even if you have to put 10 percent down that means you're loaning twenty seven thousand dollars. and if the term rates are 10 years this is a 10-year loan and the interest rates at would you say 10 percent minimum 15 minimum for some people so get this the entire amount of interest alone that you will be paying on top of that you know, just the principal, it's $15,800 in interest alone. And that is the cheapest option that they are offering. They have a variety of price points and amounts. This is so predatory. So those numbers are really scary, but they are consistent with the worst of the timeshare industry. And then Disney adds on another layer of horrible because of course they do. Of course they do. Tell me more. I can't wait. So Disney's Vacation Club works differently in this way. According to the same Nerd Wallet article, you do purchase ownership at a dedicated property. This becomes your home resort. However, in order to actually stay, you'll need to redeem points, which you accrue at a set rate per year around the world for redemption, including the ability for, to use your points for cruises and of even course. non-Disney resorts. The main idea behind ownership, however, is that you'll save money on stays at Disney properties where nightly rates can be exorbitantly high. As it stands, Disney advertises a potential savings of up to 50% for Disney Vacation Club owners compared to paying rack rates for rooms at Disney resorts. However, Disney's own website explains that it may take six years or more before you actually start to see any savings, especially since you're putting down such a large sum up front. Six years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And frankly, there's a huge resale market because people cannot maintain the cost of these. They're trying to get rid of them. People will give them away for free. People will pay people to take these. Because of that, they're worth nothing. I wonder, like, is that like if you really want a timeshare, like just buy it second hand, buy it at the thrift you store. Can. I mean, it's a bad business deal. You're picking up a bad business yeah. deal, but you can actually get a better deal if you were dead set on owning some timeshare mm. scheme. <laughs> Should you want to say at something like a DVC resort, you can purchase those points on the secondhand market and they can be pretty cheap. They can actually be cheaper than a hotel, but it's not as good an experience as a hotel in many, many ways. For a little more insight on this, we talked to Carissa Rossin, who is a personal finance and travel journalist that you can read all over the web from Forbes to Business Insider to USA Today to Upgraded Points and The Points Guy. She specializes in travel discounts and maximizing your return on vacations. She's also a California native 
who previously lived near Orlando, Florida. And you guessed it, she loves Disney World and amusement parks just as much as I do, even if we're a little suspicious of the financial aspects. Let's hear a little bit from Carissa about how the timeshare experience, especially at Disney, differs from a typical vacation. Let's say that you are staying at Disney's Grand Floridian, which is obviously a very, very expensive hotel. You are still going to be able to receive things like daily housekeeping, a different check-in line, things like that as a hotel guest, more convenient access to the rest of the resort amenities because of the DVC stuff tends to kind of be shunted off to the side. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be more convenient. You're going to have a hotel experience versus if you're staying at a DVC room, they're bigger. They're they're more intended for longer term stays. So you have a kitchenette or a kitchen in a lot of them. You also don't get daily housekeeping. So if you're a slob, um, then it can be kind of a problem. You're again, further away. You do enjoy a lot of the same, I think like the park entry, early park entry, you get that kind of stuff and that's nice. But if, if I were to go, it's, it's, it's not quite the same as like hotel versus Airbnb, but it's definitely you're, you're trending more towards Airbnb in a time in a DVC room than you are towards the hotel. I have thoroughly investigated the DVC and whether or not I could even in the slightest instance rationalize the cost. And every single time I have done the math, it has not shaken out. And that's a big part of that is because there is the resale market. A lot of people will will purchase a Disney Vacation Club ownership stake and then not be able to vacation. So then they are able to rent out their points to anybody. You don't have to be an owner. You can just rent DVC points and you get a lot of the perks. And that's a really good way for people who won't buy a timeshare to to stay in the timeshare in the vacation club properties for less than they would pay for just the standard hotel. I used to live in Georgia, very near Disney World, and I myself considered purchasing a condo in Orlando. And I went through all the steps of looking. And you know, the thing is, so Walt Disney World is unique in that the surrounding real estate is actually quite cheap. If you wanted to go and you wanted to purchase, say, a vacation condo or even a house, there's a lot of land, there's a lot of availability, then you end up being like, okay, well, when can I actually stay? You know, that turns into a, an investment full time rather than having a, you know, short term and you can go visit whenever you want. Oy, oy, oy. I mean, but but it, it it seems like it very neatly dovetails into the messaging that you see for just like buying kind of, quote unquote, normal real estate. Right. Like yeah. if you're renting you're throwing money away, right? As if you're getting nothing for that rent, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea behind timeshares that they push is that you're an owner. But what you're an owner right. of generally is either points that you can convert, like internal currency. Yes. Or, like we said, you just own time in a place. You don't own the place. And I feel like in general, a major red flag for any sort of scamminess is when you take money in a currency that you understand and know and convert it into some arbitrary points system because then it becomes very easy to disassociate what an individual point is actually worth. Like, you know what you probably put into the timeshare. But then to say, but then that like, poof, that number kind of goes away and then it's converted into these points. Yes, and, and the points can change. What, right, so like... Yeah, so those points are just a way to obfuscate what you've purchased or so that it looks more valuable in the sale. So let's cover exactly how people end up accepting this bad deal en masse. So in a traditional timeshare is going to be similar to kind of what we opened with. It's a hard sell tactic mm -hmm. where salespeople pump you for information and then use that to manipulate you. Right. Absolutely. I mean, if I think about, you know, if somebody were like, hey, what if you just bought one twentieth of a vacation home? I'd be like, uh, yeah. I mean, good. if it was such a good deal, many wealthy people would buy floating weeks in all different places. This is true. You right? don't exactly see like <laughs> millionaires and timeshares, I guess. No, because they do that pre-screening before the hard sell to know exactly who they're talking to and what level of financial literacy you have. So where you kind of started us out, right, in that kind of back and forth, that presentation, right? I've heard about these. I know that they're offered, like, basically for free. You know, you say, hey, come to this presentation, and then you can 
get a free vacation, essentially. What is that process like? So they'll typically offer you a dinner or they'll offer you theme park oh, okay. tickets or they'll offer you a credit at a hotel specifically. Uh, or if you're, say, you're a casino, they'll offer you a stack of chips. In order to get it, you have to go through what they call a sales presentation. And they say it's going to take 90 minutes. This is, in fact, a hard sale. And what a hard sell by a salesperson involves is usually isolating people, uh, berating them, emotionally manipulating what? them for money, uh, r- you know, denying people water or food, denying accommodations for people with disabilities that might make them physically very uncomfortable. Basically, everything is allowed in a hard sell. And because the model works and because it does produce results and this is such a high value get as a scam, they are Mm. everywhere. And they're offered at almost every vacation location. The original person that makes contact with you is called a liner. And it's their job. there's like names. Oh, there's a whole system. They have whole stacked books that are like choose your own adventure (sighs) sales guides for different kinds of people in different situations. Obviously, they target and exploit certain demographics more, Mm -hmm. but they have an answer for everyone. Yeah. And so these salespeople are highly trained. The original person that you come in contact with is called the liner. And it's their job to show you a really good time. So This is when you're like being taken around a resort. You're watching a little movie presentation. They're joking around. They're asking you about your personal life. Then someone comes in who is the closer. And it's <laughs> their job to stand between the thing you're getting for free. Yeah. And you. And to sell you something in order to get you to for you to get out of there. And often they'll physically block you from leaving. So it's like good cop, bad cop almost. Yeah. They'll go from being really nice, even driving you out there in a limousine. I've heard of what? Vegas. Uh, and they'll give you beautiful accommodations. And then you'll end up in a back room. So if you're with a... They, they love couples. Because if you can convert one person, you have double the chance of converting someone. If you can convert oh one person, they gosh. will help you sell the other spouse. That is so shysty, but makes total sense I to mean, me. <laughs> people have been like, I'm diabetic, I need insulin. And they've been like, sorry, just you have to stay for a few more minutes to get the thing. How is that legal? So uh, usually there are clauses in the timeshare agreement you end up signing through like these horrifying means that absolve the developers and the owners of the timeshare, like the real people who've created the timeshare and are quote unquote selling it to you. It absolves them of everything a salesperson does. So that salesperson is incentivized to get their commissions as high as possible. And whatever they do, you know, there's no discrimination between salespeople besides their ability to sell because it's not going to affect you. Yeah. So the reason that they target some of these specific demographics is because obviously older people are going to be, they'll have more disposable income and they're generally more, their future is more settled and stable. But they also will go after families and say like, don't you want your kids to inherit this investment that you're making? I honestly think that that is a real thing that like my in-laws were interested in was this idea of like their kids being able to inherit this. I I know over the years they brought it up like multiple times. Well, it's a beautiful thing if you own a vacation home where you took your kids their whole lives and then they can take their kids. But But that's that's not not what you're doing. That That idea of creating a legacy for your family is actually how one of my childhood best friends and still one of my best friends, Sal Filosa, got involved with the Disney Vacation Club. Sal's one of the smartest people I know, and he's a very well-respected librarian from a long line of very well-respected professionals. His tight-knit Italian family are some of the most discerning consumers I have ever met. They research everything into the finest detail and always buy the best of everything. They maximize their return on every dollar and every point. They've been DVC members since the year 2000, and they actually took me on the vacation of a lifetime with their DVC points, along with my now husband and our other very close friend. He had an amazing time. But even if they are in the fraction of a fraction of a fraction of percent of DVC members who are completely satisfied with their experience, it's worth noting the way that they got involved with the Disney Vacation Club. His family loves Disney passionately, but let's hear from Sal all about that. Disney, it's very hard to put into words, but it's just been so ingrained in our family. It just honestly brings us all together. Still to this day, we'll hold premiere parties whenever a new Disney film comes out and we'll get everyone together and we'll squeeze into the living room and, you know, have a big dinner beforehand and then watch it um, while we're eating dessert. 
but it's just the experience, especially being in Disney, it literally takes you outside of all of the stresses that you normally would have from work or, you know, school and friends and the craziness of the day to day. And it just puts you somewhere else where you just have happiness and the bliss of spending money on things that you want to spend money on and <laughs> all the characters you get to see and, and love on the screen and they get you get to just hug them in person. We knew um, that we wanted this for us and also for the future, us, the family. So my, my two nieces. It's a fun story about why and when we joined the Disney Vacation Club. So I only have this in front of me because I pulled it, but um, we bought in a few times. But the first time that my parents bought in was the year 2000. So I was, how old was I? 12 years old, 12 years old. The reason that we bought in was we stayed at a value resort and it was extremely tight quarters. It was the four of us. So my two parents, my older sister and me, and it was just not a great experience at all. I even uh, remember like bloodying my shins on every time I had to walk around the bed to get to the bathroom because it was so tight. And we hated it to the point that my dad actually went over and just signed us up for a Disney vacation club. He had been in inquiring about it leading up to that, but it was sort of enough is enough. This is the time we have to do it. So we bought uh, then 150 points in the boardwalk. And at the time it was only $65 a point. It has gone up tremendously since then. And while they're going to obfuscate the actual financials of this, what they're also not going to show you is the fine print. So while you're in that hard sell, they're going to be pushing as much emotional manipulation, nice images, snacks, like anything, any positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement that they can, and as little information. They're constantly asking you questions about yourself or flattering you or berating you. They cannot let you come up for air long enough to realize the obvious fact that Frankly, it's a bad investment to sign up for fees that can increase in varying amounts. And there's usually a cap, but they max out that cap as much as possible. And so sure. your maintenance fees go crazy and you you incur lots of fees if you don't obey every single rule they have. And any major life event can be involved there too. Like if one of the owners of that fractional amount of time access dies, there's a ton of legal stuff that you're supposed to take care of immediately wow. or the timeshare owners can come after their kids for money. So in this sales environment, they're never going to let you ask those questions or they're never going to let you get the complete picture because it would be so obvious to 99% of people. But 99% of people are not even presented with that aspect of things. And unlike if you own a home or you own, you know, outright this vacation house, like you get some form of control as far as like how it's updated, you know, what things you're putting in when it gets updated. But here it's like, I mean, they push a piece of paper that says now you owe $15,000 in annual fees. Like, what are you going to say? Yeah, no, you're committed. That's what makes it so guaranteed that people will get burned by their timeshares eventually. And that has given them a horrible reputation that has spurred most of these companies on to creating alternate messaging. So they'll call it something mm. else. They'll model their presentations different. Some of them have dropped the hard sell method, but it's only as counter programming to what people know is exploitative. I was about to say, because I think that there is definitely an awareness of like what a timeshare sale is like, mm -hmm. or like there's just... There's an association of like something about this is not good. Or they, there, people believe there is predators in the industry, but I don't think most people know that almost in, I would say that maybe there is a magical exception that I am not thinking of, but every single timeshare I have ever come across, every example I have looked at in the industry, every article and study I have read has said that they are bad investments. Yeah. And frankly, the amount of knowledge that people have about how exploitative it can get doesn't make people understand how common the exploitation is going to be mm. and how common it is that they'll get a bad deal. And you now have companies coming in who have sparkling reputations and tons of branding repackaging that model and calling it something else. Like, for example, a certain theme park in Florida with a vacation club for whom the hard sell would be a very bad and traumatizing look. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I have a confession to make. 
I have never been, and I never like it appeals to me not at all. Like the only really not at all. And even when I was a kid, I was like, I just theme parks. I think were like too too much like stimulation. I totally understand that. Well, yeah, like the only Disney I actually require in my life right now with a young child is Disney Plus at home because hello. Moana. I think you're already kind of intuiting the package that they have put together to replace the hard sales model for DVC. Like many facets of the brand, Disney Plus is part of the Disney package. So in order to understand really how Disney's been able to repackage this, let's talk a little about the Disney brand. So every aspect of American culture is touched by Disney because it is a media monopoly that has almost, I would say, the vast majority of children's brands and definitely the vast bulk of children's like revenue and entertainment goes through one company. Wow, that makes me feel great. <laughs> and so because they <laughs> basically the entire world is a hard sell for Disney and it is all emotionally manipulative and it comes into your home in forms of things you can't avoid like Disney Plus, it relieves the pressure on Disney to do those insane sales pitches mm -hmm. and it kind of frees them up in some ways from the scummiest parts of the industry because they're not going to engage up front with things that will look bad for their brand. Yeah. But in order to make up for that, they have to take, they have to ring you for so much more money. Yeah. And I mean, you, Disney is very unique in the fact that unlike maybe like a Hyatt or a Hilton, I mean, you already have a deeply captured, rooted audience. You know, yeah. you already have families lining up out the door to pay you literally thousands of dollars to, like, look at princesses. And you've got demographic information on them. Like, what yeah. you know when somebody goes into a hard sell is that there are people who like vacations, who are away from home, who are in a different mindset. You yeah. can see, like, you know, basically what race are they? How tall are they? Are they married? You can see that stuff. But then they need to pump you for information. Disney already has all that information. And usually you're already on a vacation with them. So it's pretty easy for Disney to tailor the messaging to specific people. And because people, in, in addition to that, they have a super fandom who genuinely right. is enthusiastic for them. They brand it as if you are a VIP Disney adult. You are the hardest of hardcore, the biggest fan if you have Disney Vacation Club access. Every facet of Disney exists to reinforce its image as family-friendly, as safe, as trustworthy, as quality. Which is why people find it so hard to believe that Disney could be running a giant scam. They really, really, really think that they're friends with this company. Or if even not that, that this company has too much at stake to ever try to exploit them. And a really Really important part of this is that the Disney media vice grip extends beyond things they even outright own or control. It extends to the Disney fandom and by extension of that, the Disney fandom's media empires. So there are a whole army of Disney blogs. You can Google them and it will be the first page of results where there are professionals who full time either go to Disney World every day and report on it or full-time write about their enthusiasm for Disney and cover every aspect of Disney's vacation infrastructure. Because these people are fans, they can more easily relate to other fans, and fans trust them more. And frankly, their information is usually more up-to-date and accurate than someone who wouldn't be a fan or who isn't doing this full-time. But because they depend on Disney for their income, and because they are already extremely biased into trusting the company— Negative information is not going to be discussed. Here's a package of very popular YouTubers talking about the Disney Vacation Club as if it's the most wonderful thing they've ever experienced without ever really diving into the numbers. And when they do dive into the numbers, oh boy, do they emphasize how valuable those perks are. So much more valuable than your money. Founded in 1991, Disney Vacation Club, or DVC, was introduced as a timeshare program allowing members to essentially buy a part of an official Disney resort. Just joined Disney Vacation Club. We got pulled into a sales presentation and then kind of on a whim decided to buy into it. Don't get me wrong, we did some research, but we definitely didn't expect to be buying into it and we never thought we would. I remember walking around Disney and looking at all the different stages of families and we saw ourselves in each one. For me, standing on the balcony 
watching fireworks at Grand Floridian with my family was reason enough to love owning DVC. Well, people say, oh, DVC is such a great idea. It is if you're going to take advantage of it. Right, right, right. Like, and if you're going to do multiple Disney vacations. Yeah. Yes. So Disneyland finally opened a Disney Vacation Club lounge for its DVC members. The club is Star Wars themed. We go through these doors, go through check-in, and you got all this cool Star Wars memorabilia that is laid out to go and take a look at. I am a DVC Disney Vacation Club member and have a couple different home resorts, but there are new points. So I am thinking about possibly purchasing. Obviously, once you've paid off the DVC, it feels like it's cheap. And we love the fact that you get the quieter pools staying in DVC. It, it, we, we love it. Yeah, I we mean, get cheaper annual passes as well, don't which we? we Another discount, which we bought and we but haven't actually used yet. Um, but for us, like I said, now once it's paid off, it feels like we can have much cheaper holidays in the years to come when we can get back to to the US and Disney. Um, it just opens so many more doors and opportunities. It just feels like a more grown-up way to do Disney. No brainer for us. It was definitely suited to us, wasn't it? Got another 5% off discount. How did I do that? Well, I used my Target uh, debit card to get 5% off on Disney gift cards. And I went online and paid with those Disney gift cards. Uh, you can either pay your dues annually or you can pay monthly. I do annual. And that brought it down $178. So my grand total for 2023 for 450 points was $3,387. That doesn't seem very magical to me. Now, does it? Listen, reading Disney blogs and watching Disney influencer content on YouTube can be a lot of fun. And you can trust their reviews of rides or food if you're a Disney fan with a similar mindset. But they are influencers. And influencers can never be trusted when they are selling you something. Ever. In fact, I'd like to note that I reached out to as many of these Disney influencers as I could get my little hands on, and almost none of them wanted to talk about DVC in a negative light. And some of them even emailed me back really nasty responses about how I shouldn't come for Disney. Yeah, but I'm not one to name names. Let's hear from Carissa about what you can expect from a typical timeshare pitch and the unique ways that Disney pushes timeshares on its fans. So it's going to be, it's going to differ, right? So DVC just kind of has it out there because they know that Disney fanatics are going to come. They don't have to really do a ton, but other brands, they have very, very specific demographics that they're targeting. For example, when, when they send me a message and they're like, you know, do you want to come for a discounted vacation? You have to have a certain income. You have to either be cohabitating or married. They have like a bunch of factors that they that they want you to meet in order to go and get your discounted timeshare presentation vacation because they want people who have the disposable income to purchase a timeshare, but they don't want you to have so much money that you don't need to finance it because financing adds the interest rates are just astronomical a lot of the time. So they're looking for very specific people that they can kind of sell this product to people who have enough disposable income, but maybe aren't financially savvy enough to know that what they're being sold is, is, not great. I'm, you know, I'm a fool for those meetings because truly like they gave me, um, I think it was three 99 for five nights in Hawaii. If I went and attended their little presentation and I've done it repeatedly and they don't seem to get the message that I'm just not interested. So, so here's what it looks like. Um, and I've been to a few different ones. You, you walk in and they're all very nice. It's kind of like purchasing a car. You know, they're all, oh, would you like some water? Here are some snacks. Let's escort you to the, you know, back room where we can sit down and chat. Um, I've had a variety of experiences. Usually what happens is you show up, they've got like the 90 minute limit, but they try really hard to make it three, four or five hours because the longer you're there, the more they can beat you down. Uh, they'll start with like a slideshow. They've got all these, this fancy technology. It's like, look at all these things you can do. Here are the perks. There are no downsides. We promise they're selling like hotcakes. You don't know what you're talking about. We know what we're talking about. Everybody in, in the universe wants to be an owner of at our timeshare, which is different from all other timeshares. And if you, if you don't purchase now, this opportunity is going to go away forever. This is it. Buy now or forever hold your peace. And then if you say no, then they're like, well, hold, hold, hold on. Maybe we can rearrange the pricing. Let me go get my manager. The manager comes in. It's like, it's very just like, you know, a lot of the time they'll take you on a tour of the property. They'll force you to look at the rooms um, to be like, look how good 
our stuff is. Um, look how world, it's applicable worldwide. You can stay anywhere you want. Uh, they have so many tactics that they use. And it is, honestly, it's very uncomfortable. If you don't want to buy, th- when you make it clear that you're not going to buy, all the niceness vanishes, the snacks disappear, the manager stalks away, right? Like it's not a pleasant experience. Is it worth it a lot of the time? You know, if you're doing some one of those discounted things, yeah, it can be worth it, but it's not it's not something that's nice. And if you have someone who's susceptible to to persuasion or sales tactics, you don't want to bring them with you um, because they'll get them. I had I had one representative one time tell me that I was a low class person because I didn't want to purchase their higher end timeshare. And I was like, you know, that's fine. I'll I'll be your low class version if it, you know. The vacation club, the Disney Vacation Club is just Disney's version of a timeshare. It is admittedly less pressure and maybe more transparent than other timeshare companies or sales tech. They don't use those same kind of sales tactics. They've got their little stands inside of the parks and you can opt to schedule a meeting and this and that, but they don't do the same sort of advertisements that say like Hilton does where they will call you and be like, we'll do, you know, we'll give you a vacation in Hawaii if you want to come do our timeshare presentation. And again, it's very, very high pressure sales tactics, but it's still at its heart a timeshare. I have broken down the numbers with them. I have had the conversations and at the end of it, you know, everyone always becomes very frustrated because I'm saying, you know, look, the numbers don't add up. Like we have, we have a literal calculator in front of us. Like you say, this is how much I would spend if I did it myself. And here's how much I'd spend if this was the timeshare, but spending myself is less than the actual timeshare. So like, it's just not working. There's no situation really. Hey guys, it's Chelsea here, and I'm just popping in to let you know about the Society at TFD, our exclusive members-only community available to join here on our YouTube channel, as well as on Patreon. If you want to support TFD and the special projects we work on, like fan-favorite podcast Too Good to Be True, we'd love for you to join. Giving to TFD directly is the best way to ensure that we can keep making the content you most want from us. The Society is available both on YouTube and Patreon, and before you ask, the membership offerings are very similar on both platforms, so you only need to join one. Some people prefer YouTube, so join us there. Prefer Patreon? Join us there. And since you guys have been asking for clarification, here's a breakdown of what you guys get for each tier on each platform. On YouTube, our membership tiers are $2.99 and $4.99. For $2.99, you get loyalty badges and Mon emojis on YouTube, 40% off TFD digital events, monthly office hours with Chelsea, access to our Discord community, access to our monthly book club, and access to our questions answered by me or guests on the financial confessions. For $4.99, you get everything from the $2.99 tier, plus exclusive ad-free videos each month where you can catch me rant about Dave Ramsey, TikTok face, girl bossing, goop, and so much more, entire backlog of ad-free bonus videos, 50% off TFD live digital events on everything from $12 workshops to $199 courses, priority access to get your questions answered by me or guests on the Financial Confessions, And over on Patreon, our tiers are $7 and $12. For $7 a month, you get exclusive ad-free videos each month, our entire backlog of ad-free bonus videos, 50% off TFD live digital events on everything from $12 workshops to $199 courses, monthly office hours with Chelsea, access to our Discord community, access to our book club, automatic enrollment in exclusive Patreon-only newsletters, priority voting on the monthly book club selection, and priority access to get your questions answered by me or guests on the Financial Confessions. For $12, you get everything from the $7 level, plus our weekly Ask TFD Anything newsletter, where you get your personal questions answered by the TFD team. No topic is too small or too big to ask. The Society has something for everyone, so click the link in the description of this episode to join us on your preferred platform. Wow. I mean, I don't know much about Disneyland, but I do know that the more like it's all about like being VIP or whatever, like skipping lines and like basically paying more to have this next level access and experience. When I was growing up, Disney was a lot less like that. And I we went to Disney a lot. I, you know, full confession, have a fascination with the Disney brand. I am a genuinely a fan of theme parks, but I have a, more of a fascination with Disney than I am a fan of them. Yeah, yeah, capacity. yeah. But... I we went a lot and the pricing was different. It was lower, obviously, because of inflation, but also like, you, you didn't have to pay for every single thing and you didn't have to reserve everything in your day. You have to reserve things now? So, for example, let's just look at a basic Disney vacation for a family. And a lot of families feel a requirement to do a Disney vacation, especially before kids reach a certain age. 
they feel like the, the the messaging is that you're a bad parent if your kid doesn't have an experience at Disney World. And that is an enormous financial strain to put on a family. A Disney vacation is very expensive. It can go anywhere from a few thousand dollars all the way up to 50 grand. <gasps> And a lot of people are putting these on credit cards. And I mean, this is like, is this is in Orlando, Florida, yeah, right? Yeah, this is in a swamp. <laughs> I, $50,000 to go to a swamp. I am joking. That is how Orlando started as a swamp. It was very cheap, and that's why Disney bought it. Well, strong-armed people into selling it to them. But that's another story for another day. Now, Orlando has some really nice areas and some more depressing areas, but the wealth inequality is so outrageous that I couldn't imagine choosing to vacation there outside of something like a theme park experience. And even if you do really enjoy your time at Disney World, you're making the Orlando area worse. A lot of Disney World employees live in their cars. They survive on food stamps, and they usually live with multiple other employees. Disney even has taken to employing college students in their Disney college program who they barely have to pay because they're giving them, quote, experience and credits. Disney calls their employees cast members. And unfortunately, every time you go on a Disney vacation, that wonderful experience is made entirely on their backs. Now, they have a union and they have been trying to negotiate for better wages. And I think this year they got a dollar raise. But it's not great. I went to Orlando once uh, as a part of like a convention or whatever conference, not convention. And I I remember actually coming back in the airport and standing in line in TSA surrounded by these families that I mean, they literally looked like they'd seen death. Like they're just like hollow eye. Nothing just like, takes it out of you <laughs> or your wallet like Disney. Sprung out. And but I mean, the lines, it, it was insane. I was like, oh wow, this is real. I know that I'm in like a super, super tiny minority that has, you know, just no interest in doing something like this. I know I am the weird one. Well, Disney has this amazing advantage. Obviously, they've spent billions of dollars over decades to build like uh, something for everybody in one space. But they also have this amazing advantage that like, unlike other timeshare sales, and the reason why we need to spend so much time talking about why Disney is different than other timeshares outside of their enormous market share is that you're locked into coming regularly. and. Every part of their park pumps you for money. It's not just the cost of admission. It is lunches. It is water. It is pictures taken around the park. It is hotel stays. It is toys. It is paying to skip lines, which you now have to do. It is really a total control over you and then a pumping you for money. And so when you sign up for a Disney Vacation Club or any timeshare, you're going to be giving those people money regularly. But with Disney, there's the added aspect like a casino of while you're here, you're also completely vulnerable to everything we can push on you. I was just about to say this feels casino-like to me. Well, yeah, the difference between Disney and a casino is that at a casino, there's a chance you'll win money. At Disney, you're just going (laughs) to meet someone in a costume. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk real numbers. For admission off season at Walt Disney World in Florida, you can expect to pay four hundred and nineteen dollars and eighty five cents per adult for entry into the four main parks over four days. What? That's a lot of money just to get in. But obviously, you have to keep in mind that Disney World defines adult as anyone over the age of ten. No, are you <laughs> serious? Yes. And additionally, this number excludes the eighty five dollars per adult optional optional park hopper fee and for admission in the peak season at walt disney world which includes going at christmas or halloween or the fourth of july or any other major holiday where children are off from school entry into the four main parks will cost 556 dollars and 79 cents per adult each of those days altogether excluding again the 85 dollars per adult optional park hopper fee i'm already overwhelmed But that's just to get into their parks, which is why you're going. But you have to stay somewhere, right? So now you have the quote unquote affordable DVC option of spending tens of thousands of dollars up front and committing to decades of fees and being locked into this one vacation. Alternatively, they're still going to pump you for money, of course, and pump anyone additional you want to bring on, say, a DVC vacation for money when you run out of points. 
So in terms of lodging at Walt Disney World, a stay at Disney's Grand Floridian Resort and Spa will cost you roughly $700 a night off season. What? This goes over $1,000 per night during (laughs) their peak season. Listen, there better be lots of, I I don't know, like gold. I I don't even know what I would want, like for $700 a night. It's a nice vacation, but it is an enormous amount of money. And frankly, staying with Disney is almost always more expensive than staying off property. I see. This often leaves families going into debt just to make these vacations work, especially against this imaginary shot clock of like, I got to get to Disney World while my kids are the right age. Oh, my gosh. What is that right age? I mean, I'm I'm looking at my kid. I'm like, she's four. And like, what is she going to? I just can only envision nightmares. I personally believe, as someone that does go to a lot of amusement parks, under the age of eight or nine, you're there for photos for the parents. Wow. Over that age, you have that Goldilocks yeah. zone until you're like 16. Then you're like, I'm too cool for rides. They're not whatever. retaining anything at that age. No. And I I mean, I knew a, I had a mom friend who, honestly, she talked to me about this exact issue. I mean, it took everything in me. She was kind of like a newer mom friend of mine. And I was like, oh, not gonna say anything but she was talking about how insanely expensive this disney vacation was and her kids were like four and two and i was like (laughs) and on top of that when you go on a disney vacation nowadays you're reserving every single thing you want to do you want to go on a ride you want to go to lunch you want to go to dinner you want to get a drink every single thing stressful is reserved months in advance what and you are stuck with it and so if you end up not being able to do those things or getting sick or changing your mind you lose money you lose the value of your time and you get stuck in lines and stuff like that they also have their optional genie plus lightning lane service They say it's optional, but it is absolutely required to enjoy any day at any Disney park, in my opinion. Genie Plus Lightning Lane is their service for reservations and line cutting, and it can charge you anywhere from $15 to $35 per day per person, depending on the day that you go. You then may also need to purchase additional Lightning Lane packages per ride, depending on what you're doing that day. Now, it does include photo pass, which normally you have to pay extra for, which is where you can get photos taken on rides or around the park by cast members. And they do offer Genie for free, just like Genie Not Plus, but that doesn't really help you in any capacity. It just gives you suggestions for ride wait times, which get this, are usually a huge lie because Disney is trying to manipulate crowds for crowd control. So they'll overestimate or underestimate the ride time to push you into different parts of the park and to push you to purchase an additional fee to cut the line. Now, if you purchase this service, you also have to be making reservations way in advance, including waking up at 7 a.m. that day to complete the purchase and start making reservations. These reservations apply to rides, they apply to restaurants, they apply to character meet and greets, you name it, and Disney wants to know where you'll be and when you'll be there before you get there so they can staff as minimally as possible and pay those people almost nothing. I don't yeah. know what to say to that. Like, that just seems, it seems like the point of going is seeing these people. Because I know, I can tell you, if my four-year-old saw, you know, Rapunzel just walk, I mean, she would lose her goddamn mind. That's hours. And, like, that's time you could or should have, you've reserved in other places in the park. So you're losing, like, your actual return on what you paid for this vacation. That's even harder if you're a DVC member who has been paying year-round for many years and has committed to going to Disney regularly and has committed to coming back. Disney is not incentivized to make your experience any better than it was the first time. Here's Sal discussing how the Disney experience has changed and a little bit about how he thinks Disney could improve the situation, at least immediately. Disney has dramatically changed over the years, especially in the last like 15 years, I would say. It's great that they're being able to include more aspects of, you know, their, I guess we'll just say portfolio because they are a giant conglomerate company. The addition of all the new rides and experiences that they have, though, are 
I mean, the technology has really just changed dramatically and it's just surpassed like any expectation that I could ever have. I mean, I'm, I don't work in theme park development or technology really. So being able to go on these new rides is just like a mind blowing experience. They're just so neat. And it's just, they've done a, I mean, a, even a beautiful job with just the, the outdoor space, just with, if you want to reserve an area to watch the fireworks, if you want to just walk around or like chill for a little bit, or you're waiting for a reservation that's upcoming. It, I think that that makes it a little bit more magical. Of course, it does invite even more people to come to the park. And I don't know what they do with their maximum number of occupants per day, but it, it does seem like it's a little bit busier and uh, a little more packed, a little more shoulder to shoulder action going on sometimes, which is uh, not ideal. With the addition of Genie Plus, which this last trip was my first time using it, and it, it really is necessary. Like you, you absolutely need it if you want to have a good Disney experience and try to get on as many of the rides as you can and not have to just wait online for endless hours. You know, something that they actually used to do way back when in the, in the beginning, I think this was actually even before we bought in, was if you were a DVC member, you, for a, a finite amount of time, because then eventually it went away, they did give free park passes. I mean, I think every once in a while, I think it would be a great perk to say, you know, you get the first three days or something of your park admission covered because we know you're getting maintenance from you. We know you're going to come visit us every few years, if not every year and spend your money on just about anything, anything that you, you know, you need and that you want, because we know you're going to be coming here because you're committed, you bought in. That would be really, really sure me right now, sort of mo most of the perks just dropped out a little bit. I mean, I will say there is the exchange program with RCI. So if you don't want to stay on a Disney property necessarily, or like just to go to one of the parks in the world, you can just exchange it and just stay at any hotel. It's a little, it's a little tricky to use. The point exchange is the value is not necessarily there, especially if we're using the chunk of our points for one Disney trip and we're, we're holding on to some, we're banking some so we can do a whole family trip. It doesn't leave much room for us to use those points for anything else. So then we always have a, you know, there's always a margin of them that expire. So if, if they can always work on that and come up with more specials, I mean, and sort of push that, I, that would be wonderful. At this point, if like, if like this is why you're going is to meet these characters and to ostensibly give your kids this kind of like once in a lifetime, just like peak experience, by the time you get in and you've paid for all this stuff and then somebody's like, oh, and now you need to pay to like reserve or, or whatever, like whatever the next level is, like you're so pot committed, which is a poker term, which is like when you've put a ton of chips in, you are more likely to stay in yeah. even if you get dealt a bad hand than if you had less in and you were dealt the exact same hand. This is what they do with Genie Plus and Lightning Lane is that you're in the park and you realize I can't get on any rides unless I pay them extra money. Where are you yeah. going? Yeah, you're a captive audience. Exactly. So every single person in your party is now paying $85 because you want to improve your day and then $15 on top of it. And this is for everyone over the age of 10. So if you're a parent and you bring your three or four kids... That's an enormous amount of money every day. I cannot imagine. So in order to do this, you want to keep people uh, separated. You want to keep them near shopping locations, food locations, away from bathrooms so that they need to cross the park in order to come across things they can buy on their way to the bathroom. You want to keep people in lines because it keeps them off of other lines. You want to push people around. And so Disney, in order to do this, has rolled out a ton of digital technology that they track everything you do. But in order to also do this, they have their Disney Vacation Club, which lets them control you not just in the park. And, you know, I'm, that level of control lets them max out their parks. And so they have control of like a full park every single day. You, They also get control of your finances when you're at home because you need to be paying for your Disney vacation regularly. Yeah, like the, the vacation follows you in the And they know way. that you're coming back. They wow. know they have you and they can plan for that. It seems like the Vacation Club is a is like a very natural way to when people are already feeling squeezed to offer them a seemingly cheaper alternative is like that makes sense that that would be very 
enticing. Yeah, I mean, and especially when you're throwing in extra perks, people believe that they're going to Disney regularly and it is all about the perks. And so you can say to people like, you know, what would it have cost for you to have all of these extras that you maybe weren't going to buy already? Like the year-long gold park hopper unlimited ticket most people buying into the dvc are only going to use that for the amount of days they've purchased to go on vacation every year but they you know they throw it in because they know that you'll see it as a value add even though they're not actually adding value so the reason that a lot of these disney fans get involved is because they are dedicated to going to these resorts regularly but as we've talked about before things can go wrong so for example most people can stay with about 11 months notice at the resort that they, quote unquote, have an ownership stake in. 11 months notice? 11 months. And you have to give seven months if you want to go anywhere else. But it is increasingly hard to get in to mm-hmm. any of the Disney Vacation Club units because Disney has sold so many of these. Oh, that's sad. Now, if those amounts of time seem confusing to you, it's because they want to give you an extra leap on other people trying to book at your home resort. So you have four extra months to try to get placement there. Then there's a free-for-all of all the DVC members seven months out from there. As you can see, the annoyances and complications and constant need to reassure Disney that you will be spending X amount of money on X date way before you actually get the chance to enjoy any of it begins the moment you start trying to use your DVC membership. So before we begin to wrap up and come to some conclusions, let's talk to Carissa one more time about the future of Disney, whether it could ever be reined in, and if you're determined to see Disney's phenomenal, fantastic stage performance at Hollywood Studios, or just the Epcot fireworks show, which kind of sucks now, how you could do that going forward in a way that might not break the bank. I think that Disney probably as a global brand is is strong enough to withstand basically anything that governments will throw at them. Maybe not in places like China, which has, you know, a regime that is less forgiving to capitalism, we'll say, but certainly in the West and in Western countries, you know, Europe and and the US, I, I don't know how, unless the federal government came down Very unlikely. Unless the federal government came down and was like, you know, you're a trust and due to the antitrust legislation, we have to break up your whatever. Short of that, I don't see them being reined in anywhere. I will say I read all the Disney blogs as well. I use the Disney blogs to learn about restaurant reservations, um, which breakfasts are the best deal, where I should go when I am at Magic Kingdom in the morning, like which way should I run? Those are the kinds of things that I read the Disney blogs for. When I want to learn about where I should be staying or ways to save money, I go to places like Nerd Wallet or Business Insider has a really strong arm for that. They tend to give more personal finance oriented advice that will help you if you're looking to if you're looking to make it to Disney on a budget while still having a really good time. Like those are kind of the ones that will focus on that rather than just being like, oh my God, you'll see Princess Anna at, you know, whatever at the Royal Banquet in Epcot. And that's great to know, but that's not, that doesn't do anything for helping you save money really, you know, or make it achievable for at these days, anybody to travel there. To read more of Carissa's work, you can find her on NerdWallet at Upgraded Points in Forbes and USA Today, and penning pieces for the points guy. So, in conclusion, you you need to learn a textbook's worth of information to maximize a Disney vacation before you begin financially at risk over this. Yeah, I mean, I when I think about, uh, obviously, like the one person that I know who owns this timeshare, I mean, I have to say, they are, are the kind of people who will look at every rule they will call they will say this is not like this i mean the detail orientation just like blows my mind it seems like that's the people who maybe maybe get scammed the least (laughs) yeah (laughs) well then that's the thing is that you know if you if everything goes right and you were to you were already going to spend this money and you know how to control yourself in the (laughs) sales icon that is disney world If you're able to do that and you are able to maximize every rule and everything goes your way, you can end up saving money. 
But what is the likelihood that that will be you? Yeah, like basically none. And the other perks you get, the trade-offs to me are not worth it. Not only financially are you losing money, but a Disney Vacation Club hotel stay is not the same as a regular Disney hotel stay because they already have you. Like Carissa mentioned, you're not getting maid service or turn down service. So I hope you like cleaning on your vacation. Oh, I cannot. The gall, the gall to not do that. That, oh my gosh, that blows my mind. Yeah, that to me says it all, right? But that kind of thing isn't off-putting to Disney adult super fans. That's not the kind of thing that says it all to them. <sighs> well, on that note, Sal Filosa is a private person, so don't go bothering him. Let him enjoy his Disney vacation in peace. But he did send me a follow-up voice memo that I kind of think perfectly encapsulates the petty nonsense that Disney is mired in right now and the kind of thing that's turning off even the people who eat all the Mickey waffles and drink their Orlando-flavored Kool-Aid. Bring back the Magical Express. It's such it's such a small thing to them where it's just a shuttle ride and they transfer luggage. And maybe I get that you can't transfer luggage anymore, but just the ride from the airport to the hotel, it's just such a small detail But it gets you excited for your vacation. It puts you in the Disney spirit and mindset. And it does the same in reverse. Like it kind of takes the sting out of leaving so suddenly where it's not you waving goodbye to the hotel. It's, well, you wave goodbye to the hotel, but you get back on the Disney bus. So it just extends your stay and it just keeps you in that in that mindset and it makes you happy and you get there earlier with Mickey in your mind and you stay there as you're leaving and you have Mickey in your mind for just a little bit longer. They, they got to bring that back. <sighs> Sal is too pure for this world. Silly things like that do change your resort experience, but th- it is the perks that they push on you, like making you feel VIP or that you say you can get early park entry or there is a lounge in Epcot that only DVC members can go to. But this is just a room or like an hour's early access to rides that you're already spending weeks at. And they can pull those perks at any time. Those are what Disney's giving you because it costs them nothing to do it. Right. They're going to take that away the second that they that they can or that it's monetizable for them to. So ultimately, you might be a really big Disney fan and you might really enjoy the parks and you might have plans to visit every park around the world, but this is not a good investment for even you. There is a high mm-hmm. likelihood that you will lose money and you will regret doing this. And because of the the level of branding that Disney has, a lot of people are going to do it anyway. And that's really scary. And in order to get those people to be able to do it, they need to take out cash and they need to also be able to cover their maintenance fees and you know what disney incentivizes you to do to do that Mm, get the disney credit card because they'll knock a tiny percentage off of your maintenance fees if you put it on their credit card and you get points to spend in disney (laughs) world if you use their credit card i hate it here the insidiousness is overwhelming i could talk about the disney brand and how manipulative it is for hours but this is one segment of it that i am really really imploring people to avoid wow that is crazy While I wouldn't turn my nose up at a trip to Tokyo Disneyland, because I'm weak, just like everyone else, I have to say, there are great alternatives. And we would be really remiss not to highlight some of them. So before we go, I'd just like to say that if all this Disney stuff grosses you out, Universal offers multiple parks and resorts that are currently getting much, much better reviews than any Disney park, thanks to their new Super Nintendo World. And even if I do resent the fact that they have Harry Potter installations because of J.K. Rowling's terrifying transphobia, again, another topic for another day, there's also Six Flags, which has some amazing roller coasters. There's Busch Gardens, which is one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen in my life. There's Knott's Berry Farm, which is like banger after banger of completely original experiences and frankly almost never crowded. And then there are resorts abroad where you can visit somewhere you've never been, probably for cheaper than going to Orlando. And after taking in some cultural experiences, you could hit up Europa Park or Efteling in the Netherlands, which Disney basically ripped off entirely. And which, when I went, I thought was way more fun and original and exciting and interesting. And I couldn't wait to tell all my Disney friends about all this new stuff I saw that they've never seen before. 
But I can assure you, no matter what you do, all of those places offer comparable experiences. Disney does not have a monopoly on fun, especially for little kids. So, while the new Little Mermaid movie was really great, maybe stop by Legoland instead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so when Clementine looks at me with those like big, adoring eyes one day, it's like, Mommy? I'm like... Hell no, kid. (laughs) Hope you like Six Flags. (laughs) All right. Well, that is it for the week. Thank you for spending your leisure and vacation time over here with us. It's too good to be true. If you'd like, we have another sales presentation starting (laughs) in 20 minutes. (laughs) Just Steak dinner. Keep your arms and legs inside the vehicle at all times. And we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Well, that's the show for the week. You can find Too Good to Be True wherever podcasts are available. And while you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show and leave us a review. I've been Ryan Houlihan, and you can find me on all social media at Ryan Houlihan or on my personal YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Ryho. That's at R-Y-H-O. I've been Julia Lorenz Olson. You can find me on YouTube at my PBS show, Two Cents. And every once in a while, I'll look at Instagram. My handle is at yay, it's Julia. <laughs> <laughs>